Um, so let's see, what, what we're going to do today, which is a little different from um, what we've done in the past, is just go through the, the Tesla history. Um, so starting from the beginning and then adding, you know, coming to, to present day and then talking about the future, which um, I think people know like little bits and pieces about, but I think it's important to explore the history and the motivations and the decisions uh, along the way so that, that people understand like what is Tesla all about? What does Tesla mean? Like why, why are we doing these things? And the, the decisions of the past in, inform the decisions and motivations of the future. And uh, people have, I think by now, heard quite a bit about the master plan blog that I wrote sort of a, a, a decade ago. I actually wrote it more than a decade ago, but it got published in 2006. And it, it, was, always the, it was always the plan from the beginning, because um, it's the only plan that I thought had any chance of success, uh, which is to start off with a low volume car that would have a high price because we didn't have the economies of scale um, and we had no idea what we were doing. Like, we had no, like, <laughs> like, how the hell do you build a car? Like, I don't know. No idea. <laughs> it's got wheels, it's got a body, it's a motor, like, all, other, all sorts of other things that we don't know about. Um, so, you know, being basically completely clueless, uh, we, uh, you know, we had to do something that was simple and, and, and we knew it would be expensive because we didn't have economies of scale. Like, and we couldn't even, a lot of times, even get suppliers to even call us back. Like, they were like, you're who, what? Never heard of you, bye, click. That was the usual response from suppliers. <laughs> and, um, and so we had to start off with something that was straightforward and, uh, and, 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 and that was gonna be expensive and low volume. And then step two was to have some, a lower price, higher volume car. Um, and then step three was to, to, to sort of finally get to something that was high volume and affordable, which is the Model 3 that we unveiled uh, just, just recently, just a few months ago. Um, and then, of course, there will be you know, many more vehicles and models uh, from Tesla in the future. Um, but but the, the, the Tesla master plan um, is really just kind of like a very limited perspective on on Tesla, and it's, it's really, I think, worth going into a more detailed look at the, at the history and the decisions and motivations. Um, and, um, you know, most importantly, I think I really want people to understand, like, like the decisions we've made along the way, we've, like, really always tried to do the right thing. Like, we really care about that. And, um, you know, when we, when we make mistakes, it's just because uh, well, we, you know, we're being foolish or stupid or whatever, um, but uh, but it's it's really always you know made with the right motivations, um, and uh, you know it's it's never it's never meant to be sort of something that we don't we, we say the things that we believe even when <laughs> sometimes those things we believe are delusional. <laughs> 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 so we're going to do a look into the history of Tesla. And I'd like to welcome JB to the co-founder JB. So, today. And, and just, um, and we're going to bring in a number of uh, people that were at Tesla from the very beginning, um, kind of just to tell anecdotes and stories. And this, this may go on for a while, so if you find yourself, like, you know, getting bored, I won't be offended if you want to leave. And, um, so this, 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 well, this may go on for a while, um, and then we're going to have um, a Q&A and try to get to all, you know, all the substantive Q&A stuff um, and go as long as, you know, as people really want to go. Um, so looking into the, 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 the long and somewhat sort of soap, soap opera-like uh, history of Tesla, I mean, there are many episodes to the soap opera, it's like a multi-season situation. Uh, so really, even this history is, uh, to some, it's really glossing over a lot of things, but I think we'll, we'll still give people a really good sense for how things started out, what led from one thing to the next, why did we do this versus that, um, and, you know, just understand really, like, like what happened, because there's, 
you know, there's a lot out there that some of it's correct, some of it's false, or some of it's quite patchy. Um, but I think hearing it from the people on the ground at the time is, is um, you know, really helpful. So th the way things really started out was uh, with uh, the AC Propulsion T0. Uh, so AC Propulsion is a little company in Southern California that deserves a huge amount of credit and doesn't get enough credit. Um, so we really want to give them just a ton of, ton of credit for the concept of doing an electric sports car. Um, yeah, in fact, uh, in fact, my first ride in an electric vehicle was in uh, a car that Alan Cocconi, who was uh, the principal engineer and one of the founders of AC Propulsion, built. And I was back in college still at the time. But you know, that's part of what convinced me that EVs had such an amazing potential and so much, such an amazing future. And I think, you know, the, as Elon said, they deserve a lot of credit for having laid the, the technology foundation you know, very early on for what this next generation of EVs could actually do. Yeah, exactly. So, so the AC propulsion uh, T0 uh, was a lithium-ion powered electric car um, using uh, cylindrical cells. Um, it actually started off with it being um, lead acid and then upgraded it to uh, lithium, lithium ion cells early in 2003. Um, I think it was early 2003, approximately then. Um, and the, the specs for the T0 were very similar to the specs for the Roadster. So it had a roughly 250 mile range, uh, three sort of a uh, roughly four seconds, zero to 60 time. And a lot of the specs were, were quite similar to the Roadster that we, that where we commercialized it. It did have some drawbacks, like it did not have a roof or doors. <laughs> Um, you know, or, or, or any safety systems. Any airbags. Or, or airbags. Um, and and the, the battery was air-cooled instead of liquid-cooled, so it would over overheat very quickly. Um, so it was certainly not something that you could sell to the general public. And, and it also, the, the, the production cost of, of, of a T0 was, I think, uh, basically like three or $400,000, like really, really high. Um, but, but the basic concept um, and capabilities were demonstrated by AC propulsion uh, well before Tesla was created. So, um, you know, I'd just like to, frankly, just give them a round of applause for, for that. It was like, you know. So, uh, so I mean, the, the, like I said, they deserve, deserve a ton of credit and, and don't, don't get enough. Um, and, uh, and, and in fact, in, in 2003, uh, JB and I had lunch uh, in, in um, basically in, in LA, technically El Segundo. Um, and um, at, at the lunch, uh, we sort of ended up talking about EVs. It actually was, uh, I'm not sure how the lunch exactly got set up, but. I think I was trying to get you to invest in an electric airplane. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> mm, electric airplanes. <laughs> How intriguing. Um, <laughs> still dying to do that. Uh, so, um, so, so the, um, the, the, the lunch that we had uh, in 2003 was really, re really ultimately what led to uh, Tesla as it is today. Um, and I in that lunch, I mentioned to JB that, yeah, you know, um, I, I, I've been interested in electric cars um, since I was a teenager and thought that was really the, the, what cars should be from a fundamental physics standpoint. Like it's super obvious from a physics standpoint that electric cars are the right way to go. Um, and um, and I, I obviously believe that very strongly. And, and in the future, people will look back at the era of gasoline cars in the same way they would look back on steam engines. Like it's, it was interesting, it was a quaint, it was, it was, it was, it's quaint, it's interesting, but it's, it was sort of like a phase, you know. <laughs> um, and, and, and then really electric is, is, is the way. Um, and um, I'd actually originally come out to Silicon Valley to do a PhD at Stanford um, in advanced energy storage technologies for electric vehicles um, with uh, the idea of potentially focusing on ultra capacitors with high energy density as a, as a potential solution. Um, and then ended up putting that on hold to start um, an internet company, Zip2, and then uh, co-found another one, uh, PayPal. Um, and then 
finally, after all that, coming kind of like, okay, time to get back to, to electric vehicles. Um, so sort of circle back to that. And, and JV, I think, had sort of maybe a slightly less circuitous path. Um, but you were doing like rows and motors. Yeah, I was, I was trying to build uh, hybrid electric cars with gas turbines and, and uh, a flywheel, which was kind of an ill-fated idea, but batteries weren't <laughs> yeah. as good as they were at this point. Turns out containing a flywheel in a moving car is, is not a very tricky. good idea. Trick, tricky. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but, e but even more recently than that, um, you know, I had started uh, spending more time e experimenting and understanding lithium-ion batteries which were sort of brand new in the early 2000s. You know, they were just coming on the scene for laptops and, and other electronic devices. And, um, you know, I had gotten to know AC Propulsion. Um, you know, I had, coming out of school, you know, followed them for a long time. I actually thought about going to work there, but it seemed like a little bit of a, a shaky enterprise. And, uh, but they were doing some amazing work and uh, really interesting, you know, learnings with uh, lithium-ion batteries. So I was spending quite a bit of time trying to figure out, you know, how could we adapt lithium-ion technology you know, into a much larger pack to, to take vehicles long, long distances. Yeah, and, and, and it kind of makes sense. Like when uh, GM um, did the EV1 initially with lead-acid batteries, it had a range of about 60 miles. Um, lithium-ion has four times the energy density, these days more than four times the energy density of, of lead-acid. And so just basically, if you just replace the battery pack, you go from a 60-mile range to maybe a 240-mile range. Um, so really, like, the basic math was, was pretty obvious, but despite it being, you know, fairly obvious, nobody was doing electric cars. In fact, um, you know, at the time, in sort of 2003, 2004 um, time frame, um, electric cars had gotten a sort of a really bad reputation, um, and the, the industry, the auto, auto industry had concluded that electric cars were a waste of time and um, basically couldn't make a compelling electric car, and even if you did make an, a, a, like a, a great electric car, people wouldn't buy it because they love gasoline so much. You know, so like, okay. Um, so the, um, anyway, so I, I got the, based on the JV's recommendation, uh, a, test, a test ride in AC Propulsion's T0 um, in, in 2003. And I was like, wow, this is awesome. Um, and I tried my hardest to convince AC Propulsion to commercialize the, the T0. I mean, I tried, I'm, you know, I can be pretty persistent about these things. <laughs> and, and I was like, guys, you've got you to show the world that this is like real um, and prove to the industry that, that, that they're wrong about electric cars. Um, so um, I was hounding like Dan and, and Al, like, guys, come on, come on, just you know, commercialize the T0, and then it's like, okay, look, if you want to commercialize T0, can you at least make one for me? <laughs> like, no, they don't want to do that, okay. Um, like, can you convert my current car to an EV? No, okay. Then finally, it was like, you know, I was like, okay, look, guys, if you're sure you don't want to commercialize, you don't want to do, do a commercial version of an electric sports car, do you mind if I do that? And they're like, no, that's cool, that's, you should, yeah, we're, we're cool with that. Um, so, so then they, uh, um, so, so my, my initial plan was just basically to just get together with JV and say, hey, JV, let's form a company and, uh, and you know, essentially commercialize the, 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 the T0 concept and create an electric sports car. Um, and then the, the AC Propulsion guy said, well, you know, there's some other groups that are also interested in, in doing the same thing. Why don't you team up with them? And so that's, that's when we teamed up with uh, uh, Martin, Mark, and Ian um, and created Tesla. Um, and, uh, you know, so that, that's sort of kind of how, how, how it happened. Um, but I think it, it is important to emphasize, like, you know, when we, when we created Tesla, it wasn't from the standpoint of, like, hey, this is a great way to make money, you know? <laughs> it was like... Um, like when, I, when I told my friends about this, they're like, you're crazy. <laughs> like, how much money do you, do you plan to lose? Not, will you lose money? How much money are you planning to lose? <laughs> um, <laughs> it, it was a pretty crazy idea. I, I was yeah. trying to convince all my friends to join and come and work at the company, and even some people that were building electric cars didn't want to come and join because they thought it was too risky. So it, uh, it, yeah, it's hard to understate how, 
how untrendy electric cars were at that time. Everything was, was focused on the internet and no hardware companies, nothing even remotely like building a whole car. Yeah, I mean, basically, like, in, in 2004, the, the, the idea of starting a car company was considered extremely stupid. And then the, the idea of creating an electric car company was like stupidity squared. <laughs> It's like, wow, that's dumb. Okay, um, and and so the, um, you know, I'm I'm a big believer in, like, like, don't don't ask investors to 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 invest if y their money, uh, if if you're not prepared to invest your money, um, and, and I I really believe in like the opposite philosophy of other people's money. It's like it just doesn't seem right to me that, you know, that. If you ask other people to invest, that um, that you shouldn't also invest. Um, and in my, in my opinion of the, of the success of Tesla at that point was so low. I thought maybe optimistically we had a 10% chance of success. So um, I, I actually put it's essentially 99% or thereabouts of the Series A was 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 money that I made from PayPal. Um, and and just because I, I'd rather lose my money than than any of my friends' money or, or investors' money. And I thought, wow, this is really probably not going to work. And, you know, if I lose the money, it's not the end of the world. Um, and and so, the, so the beginning investment was really just all me. Not, not from the standpoint of like, oh, this is a great way to make money, but just actually I didn't want to have it on my conscience that um, other people had invested and then I'd lost their money. And, and if they'd asked me what my... Th opinion on the likely success was, I would say, very low. So, um, yeah. And, and even most of the early employees had kind of a similar mentality. I think we knew that it was, was going to be incredibly risky and the odds were against us. But, you know, everyone believed in the mission so much and they believed in the possibility of the technology and the change that we could create that it's worth taking the risk. Even if it was 10%, you know, if you can make this much positive good on the world, why not take that 10% shot? Yeah, exactly. Um, so, yeah, I think we pretty much all, all thought, well, this is probably going to fail, but it's worth a shot. And, uh, and, 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 it, and because the big car companies had abandoned electric vehicles, we're like, it's like, man, if the big car companies don't do electric vehicles, and the, then the only option is for a startup to do electric vehicles. Um, and even though the historical track record for automotive startups in the United States is extremely bad. Um, like, I mean, like, if you look at, say, today, the only two American car companies in history that have not gone bankrupt are, are Ford and Tesla. Okay? <laughs> so I'm just getting, like, the move it, <laughs> get moving sign from the back. Um, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, like I said, this one's going to go long, and I totally won't be offended if you want to leave, <laughs> um, because we're going to cover a lot of ground. Um, so, I, you know, if you have other obligations or it's like getting tedious, don't, please, it's, it's, you know, don't feel obligated. So, um, so the uh, anyway, so that was like the the, the beginning of it, um, and and like like I said, we. We felt we had to create a startup car company because the big car companies had all abandoned electric vehicles and everyone thought they were dumb. Um, and you know, General Motors was in the process of recalling their EV1s and then taking them to a junkyard and crushing them so that nobody could ever use them again, um, which I thought was just a terrible tragedy. Um, I mean, and, and people wanted their EV1s so badly that or they were so sad about it that they held a candlelit vigil at, at, at the junkyard where the cars were crashed. Like, who holds a candlelit vigil for a product? <laughs> Ever. <laughs> it's a GM product. I mean, it's like, I don't know. <laughs> you know, so like, I don't know what kind of wake up call you need uh, to say like, maybe you shouldn't end that program. Um, you know, but if people are holding a candlelit vigil like it's like, like someone's about to be executed, then, then you should really say, wow, maybe, maybe we should not cancel that program. Um, anyway, but that was like the situation. G gasoline was super cheap, you know, $2 per gallon gasoline. 
Um, anyway, so just like, you know, it was definitely not from the standpoint of like, oh, this is going to be a great investment and a way to make money. It was just like a terrible investment and we're probably going to die. So, <laughs> um, anyway, so we, nonetheless, we, 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 we got going. Um, and the first thing we did was to uh, create the a te sort of a Tesla test mule, uh, which was to take um, uh, a Lotus Elise, um, sort of, and, and then um, highly modify it uh, to add the Tesla battery pack and the AC propulsion drivetrain. Um, and, and and this is, I think, a, a point that may be helpful to um, entrepreneurs out there that are, you know, creating companies. The the, the reality is that that like the 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 creation of Tesla was based on two fundamentally false premises um, <laughs> that turned out to be, in retrospect, staggeringly dumb. Um, so the one was that the uh, that we'd, we'd be able to use a Lotus Elise, um, a, a, a sort of slightly modified Lotus Elise, um, add an electric powertrain for, using AC propulsion technology, and 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 then be done, and that would work. And in in reality. When you convert a car to electric, and you want to make it something that passes all of the federal safety standards and um, and, and and all the legalities necessary for for a road level car, you actually have you, you invalidate all of the crash tests, um, and the battery pack ended up being too big to fit in the car, so we had to stretch the chassis, um, and you you we couldn't use the the air conditioning system because that was previously run off of the motor or the, the, or the engine power. So we need to have a new AC system. We had a new wiring harness. Um, all new suspension, all new brakes. All new suspension, all new brakes, because the car was 30% heavier. Um, the body was all different. Uh, in the end, um, only about maybe 6 or 7% of the, the Tesla Roadster had parts in common with any other car, period. <laughs> okay. And so it ended up actually being much worse than if we'd simply designed an electric car from scratch. Um, you know, it's like, it's like if you have a particular house that you want to, house in mind that you want to build, instead of building that house from a sort of, from a fresh start, you, you take some existing house um, and then you end up, end, end up modifying everything except one wall in the basement. <laughs> You're like, okay, that, 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 that's actually, much more expensive and harder to do than if you just design it um, and build it right from the beginning. And then the, the AC propulsion technology, while, while great for a, a prototype, actually ended up uh, not being producible. Like an, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't reliable, it wasn't producible, and it wasn't consistent, and it would break down all the time. So I don't know if this is, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it was pretty amazing. The, the, uh, the, 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 the motor controller, the brain, the computer that actually controlled the motor was 100% analog. I mean, it was, it was this unbelievable invention. I, I mean, it, act, genius engineering to actually make it run at all, um, but it wasn't something we could reproduce. So among the, the sort of difficult engineering tasks we took on in the very early days, you know, one was the battery pack, you know, re-architecting the whole battery pack, making it liquid-cooled, making it safe. Yeah, the, the liquid-cooled thing was really important because the... AC propulsion battery pack, even though it used cylindrical lithium-ion cells, because it was air-cooled, it would very quickly overheat, um, and it was highly susceptible to a thermal runaway, runaway event. So if one cell went into thermal runaway, it would domino to the rest of the, of the, the, pa the, the cells. Yeah, and, and it was also packaged in the doors, which was not a very good place to package yeah. the battery pack. Yeah, it it's was... like, oh, how do I get out? Oh, I can't. <laughs> it's on fire. It was... It was either, either side of the car. Um, so re-architecting the entire battery pack, making it liquid-cooled. And it's still amazing to me how much of the, if you look at the, that first mule and put it next to you know, a, a final Roadster, they were phenomenally similar, actually. It was a very innovative time when we came up with these kind of concepts and architectures that, that made it work. Um, but one of the big things were the electronics in that brain um, to control the motor. And we had to start from scratch. I mean, as Elon said, it would have been more efficient on the car. We did actually do that on the electronics. And yeah. you know, some of the, the key engineers uh, are here still that, that did that work. Um, Drew Baglino is uh, one of the, the folks. Do you yes, want to Drew, come up why don't you come up? Maybe, 
Maybe, uh, maybe you want to share a couple of quick anecdotes or stories about uh, some yeah. of those early motor control days? Sure. But, like, uh, this has been 12 years, by the way, so... Yeah, it's been, it has Drew, been a long Drew time. Drew like, like, basically part of like, the founding team of the company, so... Thank, yeah. thank you, Elon. Yeah, uh, just over 10 years for me now, um, so uh, I'm on the time scale pretty early on here. Uh, but yeah, uh, JB mentioned Al Alan Cucconi. Um, Alan Cucconi actually... We, we tried to figure out what some of his circuits did, and we would simulate them and be like, oh, this is what it does. And then three months later, we'd be like, no, that's what it does. <laughs> um, so it was kind of a learning by doing. Um, but we needed to get out of this uh, ghost in the machine world where we were with the analog PEM. Um, and so we said, OK, about a team of five engineers, let's start from zero. Let's start with today's technology, digital motor control using DSPs. Um, and, and we went out and, and set to do it as a parallel path so we wouldn't disturb the rest of the validation because we had to go through crash tests, we had to go through performance tests, we had to, you know, we had to run on rough roads for hours with cars that worked. Um, but that didn't deter our determination. So um, we, we, in like three months, we went from the first schematic to a driving car. And I actually remember that first day. Um, when we went out uh, driving and, and we, we brought JB along. And it was my first four seconds zero to 60 experience. And I had never experienced anything like that. You know, but my prior car was like, uh, you know, 80 horsepower Civic or something like that. <laughs> um, and, uh, and, and it actually held together and it was an amazing four seconds. And that certainly hooked, hooked me on, on, on uh, electric and I haven't looked the other way ever since. Um, but after that, we decided to take this car for somewhat of a range drive. So we, we, we drove through over to Mountain View to Google, um, actually went right by here with one of these digital motor control prototype cars. Uh, Colin was in the car, he's back there in the audience. Um, hey, hey, Colin, and, anything you want to come up and say? <laughs> <laughs> and I remember I was staring at the waveforms and we were like, ooh, maybe we've got a loose ground or something. And, and, and sure enough, like somewhere coming back to Redwood City, we actually had to pull over and I remember JB, we were all like, peeling back the top of the PEM cover. We had this like portable screwdriver just, to, just for this sort of exact use case. So we probe inside. We, got, we, we figured out it was a loose ground, fixed it, drove back, and we were like wheeling in, eking into the Bing garage with absolutely no power left. That's St. Collis, Bing, the Bing garage, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, the Bing gar yeah, garage. Like, super, garage. Super tiny. Like, super tiny little, little garage. Yeah. Um, and, and we almost had to wheel it in, but it actually got in on its own power <laughs> and then kaput, it was done. And actually, at that point in time, we, we, JB mentioned yeah. the, the motor control, but we actually were doing the charge control digital as well, all redone because it was analog before and really unreliable and finicky, especially when connected to like generators or you know, long high impedance lines and things. So, but we hadn't solved the charge control digital for low battery SOC yet. And so we were like, oh no, we need to charge the car. Like, and it was actually doing this, it had this problem, it was a bug at the time. It was doing this like self-destruct thing where it was running, <laughs> it was running the compressor to cool it's the battery. Full disclosure sort yeah, of. Exactly. Uh, Even though it was the end of the state of charge, didn't make any sense. We were like, oh, we gotta, we gotta get it on charge. So we ended up unplugging the compressor cable and charging it, back feeding through like the DC connection of the compressor. Um, but it was a very <laughs> successful drive, all said. Um, and digital became the plan of record. I flew out to Hethel with some other folks from the team to retrofit all the uh, EPs with... He 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 Hethel is, is Lotus. That's yes. Lotus, Lotus's look, headquarters in England. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so flew out there. We retrofitted everything, a full digital, and then we started developing you know, digital traction control, all the pedal feel that everybody still has in their cars today. That, that all came together for Roadster back then, uh, and it was a ton of fun. Yeah. yeah. In, in fact, I remember like in the early days giving a, a test drive to uh, Larry Page and Sergey Brin, um, who I've known for a long time, and, and there was some like bug in the system, and 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 damn it, and, like the, the the car would only go 10 miles an hour. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, look, I swear, guys, it goes way faster than this. <laughs> Uh, anyway, they, but they were kind enough to put a little investment into the company nonetheless, <laughs> despite the world's worst demo. But yeah, that's the, that's the digital motor control story. Uh, it, was, we, 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 it was this team of like five engineers and we worked in a tiny little power cube for, for three months and, and, and got to the bottom of that problem and solved it. And, and we still build on the leverage of that technology today with all the cars that we have on the road. Yeah, it was pretty amazing what we could do with small teams and, you know, pretty tiny budgets. When we had this incredible focus, every th single thing was just, you know, solve this problem or else.
So. And, and, and that was another thing we learned, right? You can't just take AC propulsion technology and expect it to work. So we, we really wanted to get the heart of the machine, the heart of the car into our, you know, our IP, our code. Um, and, and this was an opportunity to do that. Yeah, I mean, I mean, so essentially, when I say like the company was, faulted, was founded on two false premises, one was that you could easily modify an existing gasoline sports car to be electric, totally false, um, and the other was that we would be able to use the AC propulsion uh, technology that we'd licensed uh, for a production vehicle, also totally false. Um, they'd, they'd done some great technology that worked well on prototype cars, but basically did not work at all well for a production vehicle. So um, anyway. Um, <laughs> But the, I think the lesson here for people thinking about creating companies um, and um, is that even though, you know, even if your company starts off with, based on things that are, yeah, completely untrue, um, that you don't know about, um, the, 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 what really matters is, is adapting, is, is recognizing the mistakes and adapting quickly um, and, and, and kind of fixing um, the, the, the sort of, the false premises upon, upon which the company was founded. That, that's what really matters, you know, for people that um, thinking about creating uh, companies. Just you got to adapt quickly, um, acknowledge and recognize your mistakes, um, and the sooner you do that, the the, the better. So, should we uh, ask Colette? Maybe? Sorry. Should we ask Colette to show you a few stories? Too? Um, yeah. So let's let's have Colette come on. Yeah. Okay. Hello, um, my name's Colette Bridgman. I'm employee number nine at Tesla, so I will be coming up on 12 years in July. Um, so a lot of this history as well as being Elon and JB's history is my history. I'm super proud to be here. So back to what Elon was saying is a company founded um, on an idea that didn't come to fruition when I was interviewed. <laughs> Um, I was told that this company would be about 35 people. Yep. Um, they had a three-year business plan. We wanted to commercialize electric vehicles, which sounded brilliant to me, being the only non-engineer at the company for the first year, um, and that we would outsource everything. So as you guys can... Well, it turned out to be true, yeah. of course. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like... Yeah. So from what you guys know about Tesla, obviously that business plan took a complete 180 in the first two years. Um, you know, we're so vertically integrated from, from the top down. Uh, but it just goes back to saying, you know, when you start a business plan and you think that the company is going to be one thing and what it ends up becoming 13 years later is something totally different. But I think at the core of all of it um, is a company full of passionate people that are mission driven and when you stand behind a mission, I think that what you think you can accomplish and what you think you can do um, isn't paralleled with uh, what you can actually accomplish. So I want to take a moment to say thank you to these two who've been such an inspiration and to all my fellow employees. We have some lots of oldies out here um, that <laughs> Drew, every time I look at Drew, I just think about those weekends that they would <clears throat> work in their um, little lab and I would have to come in and pick up the paper airplanes from the ceiling and all over the floor because um, it was a little bit of like a you know a frat house back then but um, but super fun and you know we've got we've got dozens and dozens of stories about how how this mule came to life and um, how we all got here and it's DNA that runs through the company to this day so thank you cool thank you Uh, thanks, Colette. I mean, Colette's made a huge contribution over the company for, for the company over over many years. So th thank you for everything you've done. Uh, um, so then, yeah. So building the roads to test mule, um, and uh, you know, you've heard heard a lot about that. Um, th then we needed to get to uh, an actual roads to prototype um, that was sort of um, along that was more of the the production design. Um, and so then we, we, we redid, redesigned the, the, the body. Um, I was basically the, the chief designer of the, the body. Um, so, you know, if you like it or don't like it. For Roadster version one and one and a half, um, that, that's, that's basically, it's basically me. <laughs> so, um, and um, 
like my two favorite cars were the McLaren F1 and the Porsche 911. So if you know, there's sort of elements of that in in the design. I, I don't think I'm a good designer, by the way. Um, the, but uh, that that we're, we're going to get to Franz, who who <laughs> is a really good designer. <laughs> um, and and actually. But the, it's, it's relatively easy to design a sports car that looks good because the proportions naturally lend itself to, to, to excitement and beauty. Um, and it's incredibly hard to make a sedan that looks good. Um, like that's a whole, whole different level. Yeah, and this, this picture in 2006 was um, actually from our Roadster launch event. So this was a really pivotal event in the company's history. It was the time when we went out of stealth mode. You know, before this, nobody had ever heard of Tesla. We'd never had a single media article. Um, we'd never taken any uh, customer deposits. We, we had no customers. We had no sales team, actually, no, nothing. Nobody had heard of the company. They thought Tesla Zero. was like, was a rock band. <laughs> <laughs> or if you're a scientist, like, if you're a scientist, Nikola Tesla, of course, but, but for, in the public, like, oh, you mean the rock band? Okay, uh, no. <laughs> By the way, those guys are awesome. <laughs> they've, been huge, they've been huge supporters all the way along, and they never bugged us about the fact that we like, used their name and everything. Um, so, um, yeah, rock on Tesla, the band. <laughs> but, but this event was, was awesome. I mean, this was, um, we, we had two prototypes built at this time. So we, we had that yellow yeah. mule that we started out with, and then we built two working prototypes for this event. There was a red car and a black car. And uh, you know, we had this kind of concept at the time to do an event where we'd give customers test drives, and then we'd start taking reservations, and, and, all, and do it all at some giant big party, maybe at an airport. And this, this sort of formula became something we, we started to repeat, and it kind of yeah. became the Tesla DNA a little bit of how we would do product launches and, and, uh, and start getting customers closer to the product. This, but it, this was at the Santa Monica airport, and yeah, it, basically in LA. So. And it was just, it was awesome because we got, you know, we went from zero to having all these customers, hundreds of them, we thought, it was massive numbers, hundreds of them, you know. Yeah, and, and we really thought that was crazy, that like a hundred people would buy our car. <laughs> we, we had the names, like, we were like, we got a hundred people to buy our car, that's amazing. There, there was actually a projector and we'd type in everybody's name. Everybody's name, yeah. And put it on the wall, because um, we thought there'd be like 10, but yeah. it filled up. So anyway, it was, it was pretty amazing, even though the cars were basically just, just hardly holding together. Yeah. I mean, those two cars were, <laughs> were basically destroyed by the end of the night. Um, you know, that was our, most of our durability testing, and you know, we, even, we had to drive them behind a curtain and actually pump ice water through parts of the, the powertrain <laughs> in order to keep it from overheating so we could keep going with more test drives. Um, so nobody knew this at the time. And it, it, was, it was amazing, though. I mean, we left that event yeah. with demand being 10 times what we expected and you know a whole ton of engineering challenges to go solve but we knew for sure that people wanted this car in numbers that nobody else expected they did yeah exactly it was a hugely energizing event because um, we had no idea whether people would like we thought maybe well maybe nobody will buy the car you know except for like friends and family or something but uh, um, but, but but we got like a like st total strangers bought the car which was like wow that's really Wow, okay. Um, so it, yeah. was, it was a long road. It was, a long, it was a, much, such a long road. Much longer than I think we ever expected from 2006, showing off two cars that could do a few test drives at an airport, you know, through to when we actually would need to deliver those hundreds of cars we, we, we had sold. Yeah. Hundreds, I mean. <laughs> the cars we rejected for... Uh, Holy um, mackerel, <laughs> Jesus. We have like an army of cars here. I'm looking like, like we're going to be able to deliver four cars to the sales team. This is frightening. What's going on here is the, uh, the team has been doing a little bit of rework today. Remember I was talking to you earlier about the vehicle that had the, uh, the noise? The uh, drivetrain issue, so we're swapping in the new one right now. Let's not even wait for the analysis. Just put a new powertrain in, in, table it for analysis, and, and let's, let's get it out there. Absolutely. Right now we're facing an issue, which is that it's a, sort of a crisis of confidence among our customers. Yeah, I mean, if anybody's interested, in, uh, I think that there's a great movie by Chris Payne, um, who did uh, um, uh, a well-known documentary called Who Killed the Electric Car, and then he did a follow-up documentary called Revenge of the Electric Car, and it ended up following um, four, co four car companies, one of which was, was us. Um, and, um, and so he, he actually, uh, the, the movie actually follows pro what was the most difficult um, 
time for Tesla in, in its history and like you know multiple near death experiences. So I'd really recommend. I just want to give a shout out to, to Chris Payne, who's just an awesome awesome dude. Um, and it's it's like if you're curious about like the uh, you know seeing like the early history of Tesla, uh, the Revenge of the, of the Electric Car is is a, a great movie to, to to watch and get a sense for things. Um, we had so many. Since, since, as I said, we had no idea how to build a car, um, we had so many huge challenges with with the Roadster. Um, like one of the biggest was that the the, the transmission um, d d didn't work, um, <laughs> and, and and we'd actually contracted with three different companies to to build the transmission, and it because it was originally going to be a two-speed transmission because the the motor from AC propulsion, motor design from AC propulsion. Um, required a two-speed transmission in order to achieve the specs that we promised for the Roadster. So you could not achieve the zero to 60 time. Um, you could either achieve the zero to 60 time or the top speed, but not both, unless you had a two-speed transmission for um, an electric car. And the problem is that an electric car transmission is really different from a gasoline car transmission because the RPM is much higher, the torque transfer is much higher, and so when when we'd work with these like quite well-known companies building transmissions, um, the, the transmissions all broke because they, they just couldn't take the torque transfer and the RPM. Um, and the first roadsters that we did, we delivered, um, which were about a year later, um, actually still had the the bad transmission that our suppliers had had delivered us, but we we locked it in second gear. So the acceleration was actually not, not very good, but at least you could get up to highway speed. Um, and, um, and then we, we actually had to end up, we, we ended up replacing um, the, the, the drive unit uh, for all of the Roadster version one cars, because um, they basically, well, it didn't work. Um, <laughs> I mean, it, it actually forced kind of a, a key invention. I mean, we, we yeah. essentially you know, re-engineered the power electronics and the motor in order to get rid of the gearbox. You know, that, that was the trade-off that we made in that, that very early generation. And once we had done that, it was clearly better in basically every yeah. single metric. It was lighter, it was more efficient, it was cheaper, yeah. fewer parts. So it was definitely the right way to go, but we just weren't ready when we started production. So yeah, we had to you know, catch up after the fact. Yeah, exactly. So, in, in fact, I remember the conversation um, that, that JB and, ha and I had flying back from the, our um, gearbox supplier, and, and you know, that was like, man, it's like JB, we are really I screwed. The, I think that um, was the, the third gearbox supplier. The third gearbox supplier, we're like, this, we are screwed. Um, like, we, now, now we know that if we redesign the motor, we can. Um, do this with a single speed transmission that doesn't require a clutch, which, which is like order of magnitude easier to do than um, one that does have a clutch and has to uh, transfer, it has to shift gears at very high torque and very high RPM. Because um, essentially if you have a single speed, then it's just an RP, it's not really a, a gearbox, it's just an RPM reducer. Um, so, but, but it required us moving away from the AC propulsion motor design. Um, so we had to redesign the motor, redesign the power electronics that, that powered the motor, but it was actually easier and faster for us to do that than to try to make the two-speed transmission work. Yep. Um, yeah, it, well, it required twice as much torque from the yeah, electric motor. exactly. So it was a pretty, pretty big redesign. Yeah, so that's why, I mean, it, it, in the end, we didn't use really any of the AC propulsion technology, um, even though they did a great job with the prototype. Um, everything had to, to be redesigned. And uh, anyway, so that's just a, just a minor taste of the Roadster challenges. There's many more. <laughs> um, and uh, of course, we received uh, you know, huge amounts of support <laughs> from the, um, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, like, you know, with uh, support like this, I mean, how could you not be energized to <laughs> solve the solution? Uh, and figure out the solution. Um, it was crazy. I mean, even our friends were, you know, sitting there reading all of these death yeah. watches, and, you know, and our customers us. were like, uh, "Do you want to buy a car?" Well, it's like I was reading about this death watch thing. Um, 
and this was before we'd actually delivered to the customers that had bought the car. Yeah. So that, that was a difficult thing when they're reading about the company that's about to die, you know, who they just bought a car from. Yeah, exactly. So, um, I mean, there was, there was quite a bit of schadenfreude um, in the media who was sort of like, we had the temerity to try to create a car company. Like, it's like, who do these arrogant jerks think they are that they can create a car company? You know, the hell with them. They're just going to die. And there were like multiple blogs maintaining a Tesla death watch. Um, it really pumps you up, you know. Um, <laughs> Um, anyway, despite that we managed to make the first uh, roadster deliveries in 2008, um, I, I got, um, and, and the, the rule of Tesla is whoever um, puts down the deposit for the car first, uh, it gets, that's their order in line. So, um, so I, I, I put down the first deposit for, for Roadster 1, um, and, um, you know, they got delivered, I think, like February or so of 2008. Um, now, frankly, this, this car, although it technically passed all the regulatory requirements for a street legal car, was completely unsafe <laughs> <laughs> and broke down all the time. And yeah, it didn't work really. Um, uh, but I, you know, I was, and it got, it was stuck in second gear. <laughs> um, but anyway, I, I, that, and, and it was all hand built. Like we, really, the production wasn't working. There were, there were so many issues that we had to redesign the whole production process. Um, I mean, for, from 2008 through 2009, we had to do a complete reboot of the design of the car, the, the technology, and most of our suppliers had to be changed out in the span of two years. Um, yeah, we, we actually started building, I mean, per Colette's story, we started building most of the powertrain overseas. Because we had this, you know, slightly misguided idea that everything must be cheaper and better if built in Asia. Yes. <laughs> and, <laughs> um, <laughs> so we, we started building battery packs actually in Thailand um, in, a, in a not very... With a contract manufacturer who, I mean, they, they were well-intentioned but had no idea how to build battery packs. Yeah, actually, it was a barbecue manufacturer. It was a barbecue manufacturer. Um, <laughs> but... But they were they were neighbors or friends of one of the other uh, engineering leaders, and uh, you know we built motors in Taiwan, batteries in Thailand. You know we had this crazy supply chain, and, and not surprisingly, it was extraordinarily hard to get good quality product at the rate we needed from these suppliers. So in that time frame, that 2008 to 2009, you know we had to do some amazing things. You know moving those factories, you know taking control of them, moving them back to to uh, California, and then resetting them up completely, because what we had done in Thailand was utterly inappropriate for what we would do uh, here. And yeah. uh, m maybe Jason? You know, Jason, you, you, you want to just say a few words? Like Jason was one of the key guys that um, r really made it happen in transitioning the battery pack in particular from, from um, a contract manufacturer. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, man. Thanks, guys. So, I mean, I remember having a conversation with, with, with Jason. It's like, Jason, um, dude, it, we are doomed if we do not insource this, the battery pack because we have a supplier in Thailand that is great at making barbecues but not at making battery packs. Um, and, and the supply chain is so long that it, it would take six months from when the cells were built to when the, the battery pack was done and in a car. And so th that means we would have to make the, uh, the capital a cost of that supply chain was gigantic because we'd have to pay for that whole, all of that inventory and process. Um, and then inevitably there would be mistakes made um, in the design or the fabrication of the battery pack and we'd have six months worth of battery packs that didn't work. Um, so th this was like sort of doom on a stick. Um, <laughs> and it's like, man, um, I I even though like the idea of like manufacturing in San Carlos was, was kind of mad. It was less mad than, than, than you know, outsourcing to a situation that, that definitely didn't work. Um, so I was like, Jason, we, we have like basically months to insource this operation so that we can iterate rapidly on the battery pack design, iron out our issues, and tighten the supply chain. Yeah, it was, uh, well, I started in, in May of 2005 and it was funny when my friends asked me what I was doing. Um, 
I would say, well, I can't say much, but this is kind of the gist that like, does that have any chance of working? I'm like, no, of course not, but I'm doing it. It's going to be great. Uh, and in late 2005, after having made two prototype batteries of uh, very different designs, we started work on our third and also simultaneously decided that we we're going to make it in Thailand. And uh, so we were simultaneously designing, in true Tesla fashion, simultaneously designing the thing and building the factory out in Thailand. Um, the CM, like you said, I think, Elon, was extremely well-intentioned, but just absolutely no experience. Um, the, the building was open to the air. And so <laughs> uh, you would literally have animal droppings on the product. Uh, and that's when we're like, all right, we got to have a building, man. Come on. Yeah. Like, ro roofs are important. Yeah. You know. <laughs> and so um, after two years of, of spending, I spent personally 50% of two years there. A uh, bunch of people in this room spent uh, as much, if not more, time there getting the thing running. Um, and like you said also, the, the lag, like we would show up in Thailand with, I don't know if you guys know what a Pelican case is, but it's this awesome plastic suitcase. And we'd show up with seven of them at the airport. And these guys would just look at us, <laughs> what are you guys doing? And we learned the term tools of trade is kind of a hot button to just go, all right, all right, go, go, go. Um, because trying to get tools and parts, anyway, we brought it back in January of 2008. We packed up seven shipping containers and we reassembled that factory in San Carlos at that Bing, uh, Bing Street warehouse that Drew was talking about. We reassembled it in about five and a half months and uh, that's where the battery that went in your car came yeah. from. And by the way, just for those that don't know the Bay Area, San Carlos is like basically in the Bay Area. It's in, it's, you know, like it's 10 miles up the road. Just 10 miles up the road. <laughs> so, you know, manufacturing things in the peninsula is like considered super mad. Uh, yeah, and this, this was kind of our, you know, it was really early, like telltale vertical integration is the way to go. And some would argue we might have over centered in some areas in that, in that area, but, but really we had control now. We, we had all the engineers right there. We didn't have batteries on the water, not only from Thailand to England, but then cars on the water from England yeah. to here. That's what I mean by the six month supply chain. So it would be exactly. like, we would only find out if there was an issue with either the design or the manufacturing of the battery pack six months after it was built. So you can imagine the insanity of having um, some in, built in d design or manufacturing flaw and have six months worth of inventory that all has that flaw. Yeah, some of the same people that we were working with building the factory in Thailand, we would do missions to Hethel, to the UK, to the Lotus factory, again with these Pelican cases full of yeah. glue and popsicle sticks and, and mixers, and we would do these retrofits of, I think the record was like 15 batteries in two and a half weeks where we disassembled the whole thing, did the retrofit, assembled it. The, the Lotus guys thought we were insane, which yeah, they, did. they had a point. Yeah. We were. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that's a, that's a really quick story kind of about bringing that, bringing it home, seven months, reassembly. And the motor as well. Boom. Yeah, we did the same with yeah. the motor years later. Yeah. So. I, yeah, I so just I, like congratulations to you on, on, and your team on, on making that happen. That was like an amazing feat. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I think, you know, that taught us a really key lesson that is still incredibly relevant today, which is a lot of the technology and the intellectual property was in how we actually make the products. And I think that's totally. underappreciated by a lot of people, but you know, no one knew how to make these battery packs. Yeah. Jason and his team and a lot of the engineering team were, were inventing how to manufacture the thing that we had designed. And that ended up being you know, actually more complicating in a lot of ways totally. to do it at rate and at high quality. And I think we learned that appreciation pretty early and that, that's helped us immensely to be able to you know, scale Model S later and, yeah. and eventually Model 3. In, in fact, and, and, and that sort of um, foreshadows the, you know, what I'm gonna talk about at the end, if anyone's still around. Uh, <laughs> 
um, which is the, you know, the, the, the realization of how important um, it is to build the machine that builds the machine and how much harder it is to build the manufacturing system uh, that builds the, the product than it is to, build, to create the product in the first place. Um, I mean, you can create uh, a demo version of a product or, or a, you know, like a, a few cars worth of a product with, with a small team in maybe, you know, three to six months. Um, but to create, the, to build the machine that, that builds the machine, um, it takes at least 100 to, to 1,000 times more resources and difficulty. Um, and it's just not something, I, I really, I would say, only came, fully came to that realization maybe even just to two or three months ago. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, um, it's a bit, I'll, I'll talk about that at, at, at the end and, and, <laughs> and, and just, just how important that is and how I think very few people really appreciate how important that is and, and how important manufacturing um, and supply chain is um, and, um, and, and how I think that that's actually the main problem to be solved. Um, but I'll, I'll talk about that at the end. So then, um, the, the first uh, uh, retail store uh, opened up. Um, that was, this was in LA on Santa Monica Boulevard. Um, it was f formerly, I think, a, a kid's furniture store. Um, and uh, you know, and this, this was really, this was like a controversial decision um, at Tesla. In fact, like the original business plan, Tesla call, called for using um, the sort of the regular sort of auto dealer network and, and that kind of thing. But I, I was really adamant that like we, we need to improve the buying experience. Like just I don't know anyone who loves the the current car buying experience of <laughs> I, you know and and usually you know when you know people tend to view buying a new car as equivalent to going to the dentist and maybe the dentist is better, um, but it's just never something people look forward to. Um, and, um, and so we, we thought, well, you know, look, if we're going to make a new car company, we, wanna, we don't want to inherit the negativity or, or the sort of the bad elements of how it's been done in the past. We want to we wanna fix the, we want to do it right. And we want to make sure that people love coming to buy a car. They look forward to it. Um, and like the most important thing I said to the Tesla retail team is like, look, the number one thing is that when someone comes in our store, uh, I, whether or not they buy a car, the most important thing is they look, they look forward to coming back to the store. That's it. Just, like, that's, that's, the, that's their goal. Make, make sure that when people visit our store, they, they look forward to coming again. That's it. Like, um, don't try to sell them something that they don't need. D don't try to sell. Don't sell. Just, like, just, your goal is just to communicate um, and make people, make, make people feel good. Um, and uh, we got a lot of a lot of opposition from the auto dealers, as you might imagine, and <laughs> they were not happy campers about this approach. Um, but anyway, we felt like, hey, man, this is we want people to love it, lo love you know, love buying a Tesla from all the way from like the initial buying experience to receipt of the car, ownership, the post sales service experience. Um, you know, it's really it's sort of about like you want you want to, you want people to fall in love. Like you want to you want them to, to just you know just just love it. So um, we thought we had to we had to do it for that reason. Um, we weren't sure if this made sense from an economic standpoint or uh, whether it was going to you know serve us poorly or, bad, or poorly or well. We just knew that we didn't want to replicate the negative experience that people had, have, that most people have in, in buying a car. So anyway, so the, we got the first retail store established in LA, and then shortly thereafter, um, another one in the Bay Area, uh, in, in Menlo Park. Um, and um, yeah, in fact, uh, this is uh, where um, I first met uh, Franz von Holzhausen, uh, Franz. Uh, yeah, do you want to come up and talk? So yeah, if I, if I knew <laughs> history then, when I first met you, I don't know if I'd be standing up here. But. <laughs> um, well, so, 
Um, yeah, as I mentioned, like the basically the I I I, I was like the chief designer, you know, for for, for Tesla for the for the Roadster. Um, but I, I I sort of fully realized like man, there's definitely people who can do this way better than I can, um, and um, and so um, but, but then I tried at first to out, outsource the uh, the design of the Model S to um, a few different uh, companies. Um, that was a whole saga in and of itself, and and, and that that really didn't work out. So it's like man. Um, I, I, I actually knew that I, I couldn't do a great job of designing the Model S because designing a four-door sedan that, that's beautiful is incredibly hard. Like designing a sports car that, that's beautiful is, is relatively easy because the proportions lend itself so well to, 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 to beauty. Um, but a, a sedan's proportions do not. Um, so, um, you know, asked around um, and was told, you know, like there's this guy Franz who is really great. Um, I don't know if he's like going to be, you know, willing to jump, but he's really great, and you should go talk to him. And then I think the, I think it was the first meeting we we had was actually at the opening party for the for the Tesla store, and it was a good party. So, party. like I think like one thing Tesla's good at, like we throw good parties, okay. Um, and um, I was like, okay, great. This is like, this is gonna feel real good. And and Franz and I, so I spent like a large portion of the night just talking to Franz at the, the at, our, at our first uh, store opening party, um, and we really hit it off. Um, sort of really been like friends ever since. Um, it's been a great honor working with you. Um, yeah, and likewise, yeah. I think um, you know, in my first conversations with Elon, I, you know, I had spent 16 years already in the auto industry. I was, you know, in the early days of Tesla, I was driving an EV1 around because I worked for General Motors and I was, you know, experiencing range anxiety in Los Angeles, experiencing the, you know, plugging in and having the neighbors come and unplug me in the middle of the night and then not being able to get to work the next day. Um, all those things um, that were kind of the, the trouble side of electric vehicles, but the kind of there was an aha moment when you just experienced the acceleration and even in an EV1, which, you know, was heavy and not nearly like a roadster. But that, that moment kind of always sat in my mind. I, I went to Mazda afterwards and continued to try to get somehow this green initiative going. But then when I met Elon and his real drive for, you know, changing the world and, and really changing the automotive industry to be much better, I realized that there's no automotive manufacturer out there that really will do this in earnest and put their money down and not have it be an R&D project. It was always going to be an R&D project for them. And it was always going to be like, okay, our main kind of appetite is for internal combustion engines, but this electric thing or this hybrid thing, you know, we'll dabble in it and see, see where it goes. Um, but talking to Elon and then subsequent to the party, I went to SpaceX where I saw actually kind of the, the proof and a little bit of the, the genius behind it and the ability to, okay, if this guy can really get rockets into space, then this car thing's not gonna be well, Although hard. I should say technically. <laughs> to, although at that time he hadn't quite at, at the there, technically, but. technically at that point we had, we had actually n not succeeded right. in getting to orbit. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. Um, but you could see the determination and the drive. And I think that's where I realized that the, the drive and the character was there. And, and for me to kind of jump ship and against the, the um, my, like my inner circle of friends and family telling me like, you are crazy to leave your career behind and go do this. But I, I realized that it was really the future in a future way and that these guys were gonna do it and, and shame on me for not jumping on board, so. Yeah, and, and I think like the, just super randomly, like the, um, in, in designing the uh, SpaceX uh, logo and, and, uh, and, and name, and uh, and then the Tesla logo name. Um, I'd worked with a couple of, of graphic designers that randomly knew Franz, um, and and they and they like they said yeah, you know yeah. they they gave me like the thumbs up. And One of my best friends was dating the the girl who was working on yeah the graphics. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's 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 kind of a small. I think it was like Kimberly. I think yeah. Was, yeah yeah. So like Kimberly was like um, 
you know, g gave, a, gave a good endorsement of, of, of me. Um, uh, and, um, yeah, in fact, if you see sort of slight similarities between the, you know, Tesla, um, Tesla name and the SpaceX name, it's sort of, there's a reason for that. Because um, it was sort of done by sort of the same team. Um, and, uh, yeah, anyway, so, so, so Franz joined um, um, basically mid, I think you started mid-2008. Yeah, around uh, August 2008. Yeah. And, you know, we had, we had talked several times about designing a, a sedan for, for Tesla. And, of course, this thing needed to carry seven people. And well, I, I said that was my fault. I, <laughs> no, 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 but uh, thinking like, okay, like, this is... I'm going to put my great, kids but... in here. Like, <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, Franz, so we people. need two rear-facing seats, okay? This has got to... This will be a good um, challenge. Yeah. I think if it was like quite a difficult set of requirements, um, and um, and we we didn't really we didn't even have the money for a design studio, so the design studio in the beginning just uh, w was just a corner of the SpaceX rocket factory, um, so we basically just put a tent. Yeah, we uh, pitched a tent in uh, like my first day. We put up the tent, and that became the design studio. We had I think a couple of contract guys, and we started in earnest. One of the first things we did was drive a forklift through a, a Fisker model, <laughs> dump it in the dumpster. And we, that was basically the beginning of kind of clean slate, start over, do it the Tesla way. Um, yeah. Kind of jettison the past of it. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> so so we, we, we just started really uh, from the beginning, when, when Franz joined, uh, designing the Model S from, from, from scratch. And um, one of the things that was obviously very important was to design a car that is meant to be an electric car, as opposed to uh, a gasoline car that is then repurposed for an electric car. So the, the fundamental design, uh, coupled with the, with, with the engineering, really t we really need to design it uh, for an electric powertrain battery. Um, and so it couldn't really be, particularly on the, you know, in the internals, um, derivative of a gasoline car because it doesn't work. It sort of would be the equivalent of a horseless carriage. Like, you don't want a horseless carriage, you want a car. Um, and, um, yeah, and, and we weren't really trying to follow any, you know, we weren't, certainly weren't trying to copy or, 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 or emulate any other car designs. It really was just, we need to make, we need to design a car that's meant to be an electric car that, uh, that, let, that looks great and achieves the functionality that we're, we're aiming for. Um, and it was just a tiny team uh, doing the Model S design in, in a tent in the corner of the SpaceX factory. Yeah, and it's amazing to think about where the car is today from its kind of little humble beginnings. So, yeah, thanks for getting that started. Yeah, thanks for joining. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, and then uh, going on to 2009, um, so the, so, so, um, and, and just backtracking slightly, and so in, in 2008, we were really still trying to figure out how not to die. Um, and what, one of the things was that um, I thought would, would really help is if we had um, a strategic partner, like one of the big car companies to be a, you know, a strategic, strategic partner. Um, and so um, I, uh, in, in October of, 2008, actually, I think it was. Um, I um, stopped over in Germany in Stuttgart and, and met with uh, Dr. Weber, who is the head of R&D for Daimler, and said, "Like, look, um, you know, we'd love to figure out how to work with Daimler. Um, is there anything that you guys need on the electric vehicle front? Is there anything we could do?" Um, and, um, and 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 he said, "Well, you know, they're, they they want to make um, an electric smart car, but they don't have a good source for the." the battery and powertrain. So um, I was like, okay, okay, this sounds like maybe we could help here. Um, and, and he said that, well, there's, there's a Daimler team, a senior Daimler team that's, that's planning to visit Silicon Valley and meet with a bunch of companies um, in January, um, I think it's like January 10th or something like that, of 2009. And I was like, okay, so we've got three months, okay. Um, and, 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 and he said that he, he would ask them to, to meet with Tesla uh, and, um, and, and kind of make their assessment. So I was like, okay, wow. So then I immediately, as soon as I left that meeting, I called JV and it's like, JV, 
we have three months to make a working electric smart car. <laughs> David was like, what are you talking about? Um, and it's like, okay, there's some challenges here because the smart car was not actually available in the United States. Couldn't, couldn't even get one. You they couldn't were, get one. They, it, they weren't shipping in the U.S. Did you want to tell, tell a... Yeah, sure. It was, it, this was a, a kind of ridiculous, crazy story. Yeah. Um, I mean, meanwhile, of course, we were all you know, hard at work trying to make the roadsters actually work in scale yeah. production. So exactly. It's not like we didn't have stuff on our plate. This was quite a non sequitur. Um, and uh, yeah, so three months. We, we put together a, a rough plan on how we could even possibly achieve this. And you know, first of all, you know, we had to get a car physically, and the only place we could figure out to get one this fast was in Mexico. So, you know, the, literally, you know, the next day we sent an engineer to Mexico with about twenty thousand dollars in cash to go and try and. Yeah, it was legal. I mean, sort of, sort of, you know, <laughs> sort of legal. <laughs> to purchase a smart car, and he drove it all the way back uh, to San Carlos. And I think the day after that, we tore the entire you know, propulsion system out of it and started designing a custom battery pack you know, from scratch. You know, we, we had ideas on how we had done the Roadster pack, of course, but that didn't fit in this car. It was way too big. So you know, a very tiny team, you know, small SWAT team of engineers, um, prototyped and architected a one-off battery pack, a you know, lithium-ion battery pack that could fit into the smart car. Yeah, and, and I, I did make things slightly more difficult because I said, like, look, you got to put the, the, the powertrain and the battery pack in the car, and it, and it needs to look unmodified. Yeah. Couldn't touch the passenger compartment. Yeah, so it had exactly. To, it you couldn't just, fit. like, put it, you know, put it in the, in the, you know, in, in the trunk, like, just have a big battery pack sitting there in the trunk or something. It's, it's like it needs to look like it's a normal smart, smart car. So the battery was a big challenge. We had to reinvent this brand new battery pack in a couple months and build it. Um, then on the, the drivetrain, we had to figure out how to adapt a Roadster motor and power electronic system and charging system into the back of the smart car in this tiny volume. Um, and amazingly, we were able to repackage that whole thing. You know, that team didn't sleep a whole lot in those couple of months, and it was also through the holidays, which was which was great. Yeah, exactly. Um, Thanksgiving, Christmas. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But, you know, everybody was having the time of their lives. It was super, super fun. We were in a little teeny garage in San Carlos, you know, trying to make this, you know, smart car electric. And one of the things we realized pretty early on is that this was going to be the fastest smart car that had ever been made. So this was amazing. It, it had all the torque, would have all the torque of a Roadster uh, packaged <laughs> into yeah. this I, tiny little I mean, car. it was so fast you could do wheelies in the parking lot. <laughs> Yeah, it was, uh, anybody that got in that car, you know, exited just with a huge smile on their face. They just yeah. absolutely loved it. Um, so that, that car basically led up to the meeting where we, you know, met with all the Daimler engineering leaders and yeah. executives. It, exactly. Let me tell you about the, how, how the meeting went. Like, so, the, 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 you know, the, the, the Daimler, Daimler sort of senior sort of uh, engineering team shows up. And, I mean, it was clear when they entered the building, they were, like, not excited about meeting with some, like, American car startup, whatever, you know, so they'd like been told, you know, that they needed to do this and they were like, I, they were like, well, this is obviously going to be a waste of their time. Um, and they're quite grumpy, actually. Um, and, and, and we started off with, with a, a PowerPoint presentation and, and they really didn't like the PowerPoint presentation. Um, and, 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 and like, um, so, so I said, you know what? Why don't we skip the PowerPoint presentation? Would you like a test drive? And they're like, well, "What are you talking about? What, what do you mean a test drive?" I'm like, "Yeah, we made one." I'm like, made one? What do you mean? Yeah, we made one. Um, so it's just outside. Do you want to do you want to drive it? And they're like, "Sure." Um, <laughs> so then, so then they went out and, and test drove the insane performance smart car. As JV was saying, it's like, basically, you can't exit that without a grin on your face. Um, so they went from being a bit grumpy to be like, holy cow, this is awesome. Um, and, um, and, and, and we actually, out of that, that meeting, um, it got our first development contract um, with, with Daimler uh, to, to create an electric uh, smart, smart car. And, um, and, and that was really... I think if we hadn't done that, Tesla would have died because the, the Daimler partnership gave us uh, credibility um, that a major OEM was willing to work with us. Um, and they also, you know, they paid us for the development program, which is really helpful from a revenue standpoint. Um, and then mo most importantly is, is that when, when Tesla 
uh, kind of was running out of money around May 2009, and, and I had no money left. I'd like given all of the money that I had remaining to Tesla. I didn't even own a house. I was like, and I had to borrow money from friends to pay rent. Um, so I was like, man, I am, I am out of resources. Um, so uh, I was like, we we need. I, I I just don't even have any more money to invest. So. Um, so, so then we, we need to seek outside investment. And this is early 2009. Um, and just to sort of paint the picture, I mean, um, General Motors and Chrysler were going bankrupt at the time. Um, the idea of investing in a, an electric car startup um, was not popular. <laughs> um, I mean, we talked to investors, and they would be angry that we even called them. Um, uh, but, 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 you know, thankfully, uh, Daimler did invest, and then they invested $50 million in, uh, in May of 2009, which, which was a lifesaver. Um, so I just really, you know, I'd like to just say thanks and give a hand to Daimler for that. I was like, you know. So, I mean, w without that investment, Tesla would have been, it would have been game over. Um, so they, they, they invested, thank, thankfully, um, and, and that gave us the, the resources that we needed um, to get, get the company to you know moderately healthy position um, and, and actually get us to the point where we could build roadsters without losing money on every car. Um, so the, the, our roadsters that we delivered were significantly negative gross margin until about basically third or fourth quarter of, of 2009 um, because we had to redesign so much of the car we had to change out suppliers um, and so actually every road that we sold before like say the second half of 2009 actually cost more money than it did to, we, we, we earned less revenue than it cost to build um, but 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 by by late 2009 we'd finally um, redesigned the the car and, and changed out up like most of our suppliers uh, and we're able to generate positive margin on the car, and then we had positive margin on the Daimler development contract. So the combination of those two factors got us to a reasonably healthy position, uh, but we would never have gotten there without the Daimler investment. Um, and, and I think this is important because like, a lot of people think that you know, t Tesla was like bailed out by the federal government or something like that. This is, this is not true. We were bailed out, but by Daimler, not, not, not by the government. So. Um, that they're the ones who deserve the credit here. Uh, we wouldn't be around, we, Tesla wouldn't be around if they, if they hadn't helped out. Um, in fact, we still have an ongoing program with Daimler for an electric B class. Um, and, um, yeah, and, and we're, you know, I think there, there's a great, a great, great bunch of guys. So, yeah, it, I mean, it's worth saying that that first smart program led to what became a, a pretty, you know, thriving powertrain business for Tesla in those, you know, intermediate years. You know, we made a lot of, you know, profit, as Elon was saying, and, and did some great engineering work for Daimler, building a production smart EV and then also a production EV A-class and today the, the B-class, which is still shipping. And, you know, those, those programs also taught us a huge amount. You know, being a supplier to Daimler was not terribly pleasant sometimes, but it also, you know, t trained us in quality and it trained us in some of the systems that they had used, you know, for 100 years. So, you know, we got to really accelerate up the learning curve on building some of these very complex systems and how they validated them and how they made them last for, you know, hundreds of thousands of miles. Absolutely. So, like, we just want to, you know, express a, um, a huge word of congrat a huge word of appreciation uh, for, for Daimler and, and, and um, their help with Tesla, and without which we would just not be around. So, yeah, thank you. <laughs> so um, and, and then sort of getting to the DOE loan, which a lot of people are, are aware of, um, and, 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 and t people, there's like, you know, so, some people out there who sort of constantly beat Tesla over the head with this like DOE loan thing. And it's important to appreciate what, what this program was about, which was, it was actually a program that was uh, signed into law uh, during the Bush administration, um, although 
yeah, it wasn't, it, it was executed during the Obama administration, but it was signed into law during the Bush administration. And it was a program that was intended to accelerate the development of energy efficient cars. Um, and one of the, the prerequisites for um, being in this program was demonstrating that you're a going concern, um, which is why this program was inaccessible to uh, GM and Chrysler because they were bankrupt. Uh, so, so the, but, but unfortunately in the media this got conf confused with the, the, there was the auto bailout and then there was the energy efficient, uh, energy efficiency loan program which, which really got con conflated but, but, but are, are actually completely different programs. Um, and the, 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 the first money that Tesla got from the DOE loan program was actually only in March of 2010. Um, and the way the loan program worked was that there were a whole bunch of milestones and of technical milestones um, and product development milestones that um, we could only invoice for the milestones after they'd been accomplished and then Pricewaterhouse would audit the financials and then we would send uh, a request for to draw down the loan in, in little bits and pieces. Um, so it would usually take maybe two to three months after we'd actually spent the money to receive any of the loan proceeds. Um, so again, this is like really fundamentally different from what happened with the auto bailout, although a lot of people th sort of think it's the same thing. Um, and, and the timing that we received, we started receiving DOE loan money was, was after Tesla was out of the danger zone. So if, if Tesla had actually needed the DOE loan when, when we were actually, when we were in dire straits, we would have been doomed. Um, so the, by, by 2010, Tesla was actually in sort of a moderately healthy position and the, and the DOE energy efficiency program was meant to, to serve as a catalyst for the acceleration of energy efficient vehicles. Um, and, you know, and that's, that, that was its purpose. So, because people tend to uh, sometimes um, say it's what, it was either completely necessary or completely unnecessary, and, and neither of those are true. The fundamental purpose, and, and I think the DOE, DOE did a great job of implementing it to that end, the fundamental purpose of the DOE loan was to accelerate the advent of, of sustainable transport. Um, and, um, you know, so, so we, uh, you know, we, we, and it's very important to note that T Tesla could have raised money from alternate sources. Um, that, so this was not, you know, we could have raised money from an equity standpoint or from a debt standpoint uh, outside of the DOE loan program. But the DOE loan program was there. Um, our competitors were using it. So uh, Ford, for example, got like five or six billion dollars from, from this program. Uh, Nissan got 1.6 billion dollars. Uh, Tesla for the Model S program got 380 million dollars. Uh, and then 100 million for a powertrain factory to supply other companies. Um, Fisker, I think, got 500, they got more than we did, five or 600. Um, and, um, so, I mean, of the names that you've heard of, Tesla actually got by far the least, and, and I think did, did quite a lot with, with, with those proceeds. Um, but but it, it's important, like, this, this was, was definitely helpful and served a catalytic purpose, purpose which was, in, was the intent of the program, but it was not um, a case of sort of being, as some of the accused, accused Tesla of being, of sort of being propped up by the government or, or something that was fundamentally necessary for Tesla to exist. It was helpful and catalytic, but not fundamental. The, the Daimler investment a year earlier was fundamental, um, but, but not, not the DOE loan. I think something most people always seem to overlook was it was a loan. It wasn't a grant. So, I mean, this is obvious, perhaps in the name, but we have to pay it back. And you know, that was you know, yes. very different than the Daimler investment, you know, which was an equity investment in the company. Yes. So you know, this is something where we had to start planning on how we would pay that back and prove to them that we would pay it back. With interest. With interest over you know, the expected period of time, before we even could get the loan. Yep. Um, so I just want to make sure it's sort of real precise. T T Tesla is certainly grateful for this, and it was very helpful, but it was not necessary. It was not fundamentally necessary. Um, you know, then going to, then going on to the, the IPO. <laughs> um, so so the, the IPO process was certainly an interesting, interesting roadshow. Um, there's there's uh, Deepak who 
think it did an amazing job on the uh, on the road show. Um, but, but it was funny, I, I mean, we'd meet with potential investors. You know, Tesla is a company that tends to inspire either love or hate. Um, it rarely, people are rarely indif indifferent. Like, you know, if, if say like, well, how do you feel about Colgate? I'm like, oh, you know, it's okay. Um, <laughs> but with Tesla, it's like either, it's like you guys suck or you're great, or like, yay. You know, so it's like, it tends to be very much a love, either love it or hate it. Um, and so in the IPO Roadshow, we'd, we'd sometimes meet with investors who would tell us just how stupid we were and that this is a waste of money and how dare we even take their time. I'm like, okay, thank you. Um, and they would meet with some that are like, yeah, you guys, this is great. Um, we're, we're all in. Um, you know, we have like some, some uh, you know, great, great investors like Fidelity who, um, you know, despite all sort of the negative news and stuff has been like a stalwart supporter of, uh, of Tesla through the years. Um, and um, yeah, uh, so in some way, like that, that, that was the, the, the IPO. Um, and um, yeah, that was, uh, it was an arduous IPO. Um, but but uh, we managed to raise, you know, get Tesla public um, and just sort of clean up the capital structure and, and, and raise, um, um, you know, a bunch of money from the public markets. Um, and uh, you know, sh shortly after that, we became um, one of the most shorted stocks on the Nasdaq. <laughs> so, like, um, for, for quite a while there, we were trading places as the most shorted stock on the stock market. We were I think we were trading places with uh, Skull Candy, Travel Zoo, and Coinstar. <laughs> but for who would be the most shorted? Okay, like. Um, so anyway, so the, <clears throat> then sort of, you know, next big thing, well, well this was, I mean, also in 2010, um, and, and kind of time-wise approximately the same time as the IPO, um, is that we, we met with uh, t uh, Toyota, um, uh, and uh, Akio Toy Toyota actually, you know, c came by and we had breakfast at my house, and um, and, and he, was, he was sort of, really interested in, in working with um, innovative technology companies. Um, and, and so we thought, well, well you know, what, what are the ways that we could potentially uh, work together? And we came up with three things. One was to do a, um, a sort of a joint EV program to, to do the, the new electric RAV4. Um, the other was um, uh, buying the, the Fremont factory, the former NUMI facility, because uh, Toyota had decided to, to shut down the, the NUMI facility. And, and it's understandable because it was half owned by GM, half owned by Toyota, and um, it was, but it was half owned by like the portion, by, like the, what was considered the bad portion of, of GM. GM got split into two pieces. One was called Liqu Liquidation Motors. So half of, half of NUMI was owned by Liquidation Motors, half by Toyota, and it just sort of didn't make sense for Toyota to, to kind of be in that, that kind of a partnership. So they decided to shut down the, the NUMI plant. And, um, and we said, well, you know, this is kind of huge for, for, it's a huge plant for Tesla, but, and we don't have much money, but, we, we, you know, we'd be interested in buying that. Um, and, and that was one part of the deal. And then the other was like, it, you know, was making an investment at the IPO. So they, um, they said, that sounds cool. We'll, will make a $50 million investment at the IPO, which was actually really helpful to us when we were doing the roadshow because people would ask us how we're going to compete against big car companies and say like, we say like, look, we've got the Daimler partnership and Toyota's investing at the IPO. So it's like, you know, that's, those are good signs. Uh, these two, the, well, these three parts of the deal were, were independent of each other. So they, it would be, you know, either all three could work, could work out or, or none of the three could work out. So there was no, they weren't tied together. They were just sort of three things that we thought um, would be would be good. So, and again, I'd like to thank Toyota for their support, um, and um, they just they were you know a huge help uh, to Tesla. So, thank you, Toyota. And then the Model S uh, Beta. 
Um, so we finally produced a, a Model S that was, um, you know, close to, to the production design, or, or very close, really. Um, and we, we unveiled that to, to the public, and um, it, was, it was quite well received. And we had a lot of people who put down um, deposits on, on the car, and um, that, that gave us like a big boost of confidence. It's like, wow, people really like the car. Um, it looks like we'll be able to sell enough to um, you know, pay for the cost of the factory and everything. And um, yeah, so that was, you know, thank you for everyone for, for making, for those that, that made those, those early um, purchase orders for the Model S. And um, you know, again, with, you know, without you, we wouldn't be around. So yeah. 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 It, it wasn't quite as exciting as the, the Roadster, you know, launch event, but you know, there, it, it was close. There was definitely some serious drama at this, uh, at that first Model S, you know, customer ride event that we had at Fremont, and um, yeah, I, I definitely remember a few crazy stories. I think, I think at least one point we had one car, you know, completely die with some huge firmware problem, and um, some, a, a thing we've done at all these launch events is we have a kind of a control center in the, the back somewhere hidden away with a bunch of engineers that can watch the cars uh, via their wireless connection. And I remember this car that, that you know, basically had a problem. Well, we opened all the doors and the trunk and the hood and everything and put it on display in front of everyone. And meanwhile, the engineers rewrote some of the motor control code in that car to, basic, to, to ignore the sensors that had you know, gone wrong and were the problem. So we put it into this you know, kind of limp mode and, uh, and then, you know, got in and sort of very carefully drove it away at about 10 miles per hour. And uh, it, was, it was great. You know, nobody ever knew there was any problem. We, you know, drove it back to the shop. And, uh, you know, ultimately it was like one bad temperature sensor that had, you know, shorted out and caused this problem. But I think it was really amazing that we could, you know, what we could do with this new software capability. Because the, the, road, the Model S was the first time, this was the first time we had that ability to send new software to the car. So it was kind of foreshadowing, I think, how important this has become for the entire production fleet, you know, even on that very first day when we were you know, giving the first rides to customers. Yep, so then on to Model S deliveries. Here you go. Thanks, Nancy. My friend Billy, a stalwart supporter of Tesla from the beginning. So that that was a uh, yeah, big milestone for the company, um, delivering the first production Model S's uh, from the Fremont factory, um, where at the time we were occupying just a tiny corner. And um, yeah, I think that was definitely one of the most joyful experiences uh, in the history of Tesla. Um, it was a pretty awesome event. Yeah. Everyone was just, I mean, it, it's really, everyone had worked so hard for that time, and um, I think the whole company was there. I mean, every yeah. single person, production employees, engineers, sales, everybody crammed in because they were so proud to deliver those first few cars. Exactly. So, yeah. <laughs> right. Um, so, we'll go a little faster through some of these later years. <laughs> Uh, because I think like these later years are, are better, sort of better chronicled in the press, whereas the early years like nobody knew we existed, so that's kind of like lost in the midst of time. Um, so we, we, we um, uh, unveiled the, the supercharger network, which we hadn't actually told anyone about. So when people did the first reservations to the Model S, they had no idea that that we were going to create the supercharger network. Um, but we'd built into every car uh, a high voltage DC bypass direct to the pack. Uh, that would enable high-speed charging. Um, and this was critical to solving the long-distance travel problem. And um, we, we were sort of, certainly hoping that, that some other company or companies would, would create high-speed, uh, you know, convenient high-speed charging networks, but, but nobody did. So we're like, okay, well, we better do it. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, it was, it was pretty crazy. I mean, we, we literally had you know, teams of a few interns that uh, we were sending out to different travel rest stops and trying to have them you know, figure out where the good places to put these superchargers would be. Um, interns I, are great because they don't know what's impossible. So you're just like, yeah, 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 just do it. Great. <laughs> <laughs> I, 
and Harris Ranch was actually one of our very first, uh, you know, uh, supercharged stations out on Highway 5. And I just remember the craziest conversations trying to convince these ranchers from the Central Valley on you know, how this supercharged station was possibly going to work. You know, there, there were no cars yet. They'd never seen a Model S. They didn't believe an EV could even get there, let alone charge fast. Um, and yeah. it, it, was, it was fairly amazing how this, this all grew and only four years ago. Yeah, we were kind of amazed that they worked, actually. We were like, hey, wow, it works. That's cool. <laughs> Most of the time. Um, so, um, yeah, so that ended up being fundamental to really just answering the question of, like, can I drive my car long distances? And what it really comes down to is freedom. Like, you, a car, when you're buying a car, you're, you're really buying freedom to go where you want to go. Um, and and um, if, you're, if you're constrained, if you're tethered to your charge location, you, you don't have the freedom. So the supercharge is really about making it freedom, giving you the freedom that you want when you buy a car. And, uh, and then making it real easy and convenient to, to, to go wherever you want. Um, and then uh, paid off the DOE loan. <laughs> and um, so, I mean, it's worth, worth noting, like, we, we, you know, we, um, Tesla was the first company to pay off. Of all, so all the, all the automotive companies had, had either gotten Got direct government grants, or they uh, had had um, been in the loan program. Uh, Tesla was the the first company to pay off uh, the 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 DOE loan, um, and in fact, we, we had to pay. There was a prepayment penalty, and we actually because you know, you had to pay the interest plus an, plus a penalty for prepayment um, because the the normal loan would have been paid off over ten an additional ten years. And in this case, um, so we paid it off 10 years early um, and, and just paid the penalty because we just wanted to you know, make it clear, like, look, this, you know, we're, I don't know, it just felt like morally the right thing to do. So we, that's why we did it. Um, and then... That his goal wasn't to build the world's best electric car, but to build the world's best car that just happens to be electric. Tesla? Model S. What's been achieved here for the first time is to create uh, an electric car that truly is the best car of any kind. There we go. 